Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Be the Gospel with Anthony Tijerina. Welcome to the program, Anthony. Well, thank you. It's uh, good to be here. We have a very interesting topic today. And uh, but first of all, how was your how was your week, Dorothy? Uh it was sort of okay. I lost a grandson the, over the weekend, so oh, it's I'm a little sad. But... Yeah. Well, we'll be keeping your family in our prayers. I do so appreciate that. But lose. other than that, everything is wonderful. Oh, good, good. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. How, what do you say about that? Sound good? I think that sounds terrific. I, You know, grace is such a mistaught subject in the body that I'm I'm really looking forward to what you have found out about it because, you know, everybody comes at it from a different angle, and I, I love the way you simplify everything, too. So let's get going. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, I can tell you, um, I, I thought I understood grace uh, because of what's been taught, and especially in charismatic circles and and how everything flows and functions. Uh, but when I actually took a closer look at it, it completely changed how I see everything. And so, excuse me. So when we look at, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, it doesn't say the word gifts as in Laura or a gift given, which would be Doma. Like you don't you don't find that there in Scripture at all. So there is no word for gift there. It just says spirituals. But whenever it does um, have – there's another word that's translated gift there that's called – that's charismata, right? And so we can see that it means the effects of grace. And we've covered that in a previous episode, but whenever you begin to look at it, um, the, for me at least, it triggered, okay, what does grace mean? What, what is, how does that stand out? What, what really does it mean that by this grace, we have all these effects, all these manifestations or results that come into play because of grace itself. And so uh, it opened up a whole bunny hole that I, I fell into that I wasn't expecting at all because you, know, you, you have unmerited favor. Anthony, so, you're breaking up a bit. <clears throat> yes. That you just went totally off the air. Is there... Can you move to a better place, or? Oh, it should be fine. Can you hear me now? You're still breaking up a little. Okay. Well, we seem to have some technical difficulties. Give me a second. Um, do you want me to try calling back in? I see you just came out across loud and clear when you said that. Oh, okay. Well, so I have I have no idea. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Yes, it seems to be so. Okay, well, let's continue. And if I need to call back in, I'll, I'll call back in. So okay. let me know if I start dropping out. So what was the last thing you caught? <laughs> I think it was just the, the very beginning. Um, now I've forgotten. Isn't that terrible? Um. You were looking at the effects of grace, how we, and then how it's unmerited favor, right? Okay. So, yes, yes. So, basically, you find... You're doing it again. I don't understand. So it, it's it's acting up again? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me see if I, I wonder... can... Go ahead. Uh, I'm just saying, I can't tell if it's broadcasting okay or if it's just because it is cloudy here. Maybe it's just my phone. Um, 
It seems every time I mute my phone, you start breaking up. So I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how I can get away with um, listening on the computer without having feedback. You go ahead, and I'm going to try something here, okay? Oh, okay, let me know if I need to stop and back up. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So in in Hebrews 13, 8, we can see that God is, is never changing. He doesn't change. And we also... If we look at Romans 2.11, Acts 4, Ephesians 6.9, Peter 1.10, Ephesians 3.25, even the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 19.7, Job 34.19, and Galatians 2.6. We can see that God shows the partiality towards anyone. So he doesn't favor one person over another. That is a huge false doctrine that's being perpetrated. Perpetrated by mission upon you in the today. In your in your job, in you know the different situations and in everything, and that's not what it means. Now, does it mean that God does not give you favor? In its real definition, I would say. He gives you favor, but not not a preference. It's not a preference at all. So <clears throat> just, you know, to make it very practical and kind of bring some clarity here. The word favor we use quite frequently, right? When we say, hey, Dorothy, can you, get, can you do me a favor? Right? See, that doesn't mean preference, preference at all. I'm asking, you know, for something to be done. And so when you actually go back and you look at the definition of which is the word for grace, then you need not an undeserved blessing, you could even say. Right? And so when you begin to look at it from this point of view, it, it starts to, to slightly shift a little bit because you, you, whenever God started revealing this to me, it was quite amazing as God started showing me that, you know, there's other scriptures I didn't quote, like it rains on the just and the unjust, all the same, right? And in other scriptures where, where Jesus is even explaining to everybody that God treats everybody the exact same. Amazing. Because if he treated somebody different, he actually um, gave preference to one over another, then what's, what's the point? We were struggling in vain. We're, we're walking in, in faith and trusting God in vain. Not in vain. As preference. As preference. I'm saying is, look, this thing on your behalf that is such more, is such than you will ever know. I've done you a work, a favor that is just absolutely marvelous. So let's back up a little bit and let's look at the English word. Look at the policy, which is the history of the word and how it developed. It only goes back to Latin, and it's gracia, right? So in it, you, if, you, if you speak a little bit of Spanish or even Portuguese, you can hear where that comes from and the definition of it, which means thank you or gratefulness or thankfulness. So it has nothing to do with charismata or charis, right? Sorry, charis, as in unmerited favor. Grace, gratia, gracia, gratia, all these mean thank you. So even though we use the English word grace to try to explain what it's saying in Greek, it's like way off. It doesn't even have the same background etymology as the word charis. 
which is very interesting. That's why when you're sitting down to supper or to a meal, especially in the South, they say, will someone say grace? Right? Will someone thank God for the meal we're about to partake? Is what is what in essence what they're saying. They're not saying, will somebody pronounce preference over the meal? We prefer the chicken over the turkey, right? No, that's not it at all. It's it's more of, hey, give give thanks for for what we're about to partake of, what we're about to eat. So this brings up other questions. So it started bringing up the question for me is. Does the word charis actually mean what is the the essence of grace? Is we you know, even we still use that word, right? And that's that's the word we have written in our Bible in English. And so, if if we go back and we begin to look at the system during that time, you'll find that it's it's what's called the reciprocity system. And we have it today more in the political side of things than anything else. Because in the political side, what what people do, let's say I'm a wealthy businessman, and I come to Dorothy and say, Dorothy, I think you'll make an amazing mayor. I will support you running for mayor financially with all my businesses. And so Dorothy says, you know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to run for mayor. But there's always a catch, right? Because it's like a wealthy businessman helping you get into office is usually I'm doing you a favor for a favor in return, right? So when we look at it, it it sounds, you know, because of how we view things and everything, it sounds kind of selfish, and it's not selfish at all because if you actually look what God did, what Jesus accomplished through the cross, through the resurrection, he reconciled us back to God, something that was completely impossible for us to do. So he did us the favor of uniting us back to the Father. Right? I didn't say that he gave us preference back to the Father, but he did us a favor bringing us, uniting us back to the Father, reconciling the world back to himself, right, for those who repent. So then it it begins to open up. It begins to, for me, all of a sudden, all these different parables begin to make sense. The parable of the talents, right? It says he entrusted these three servants with one talent, three, um, yeah, the one talent, two talents, three talents, right? And the the first two with the, the more talents, they they were able to reproduce it. While the one with the one talent decided to bury it, do nothing with it. And it says that that one was cast into outer darkness. They did nothing with it. You know, it's one of those parables that's always kind of troubled me a little bit. Because I'm like, what? Like, what do you mean? He was casting out of darkness. He was, he was already a servant. He was already, he was already in God's kingdom, per se, right? And here he did absolutely nothing and was casting out of darkness. And that's not to mention the unprofitable servant in Luke 17 and several other parables where things begin to click and make sense looking at grace from this perspective. Now, from all the research and different things I've found, the Eastern Orthodox Church understands this better than most people because what we've been taught as a society of Christians, especially in Western culture, is that the word work is bad. It's got a negative connotation, right? But when we look in Galatians, it says we're predestined unto good works. So there's some good works that we're supposed to be walking out that we're predestined for, but the whole thing is, is they're they're not our works; they're Jesus's works. 
right? Because when you understand his nature, you understand his character, that he's coming in you and living in you, by you and through you to impact the world, then you're resting from your own works because you're not trying to become righteous because Jesus has already made you righteous. And Jesus gets to manifest himself through you, which is a good work. See, this completely takes off the pressure of performance, of failure, everything else, because that's not even thought in your head. Because this is what the enemy will use against you. He'll say, well, what if you pray and nothing happens? What if you step out and you say the wrong thing and you fail and you fall flat on your face? And it's all based on you, 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 and your performance and how well you do something. But when you actually look at the totality of what it means and what grace means and his, his nature and character coming and living in you, it takes off all pressure to perform. And you're only doing it because it's your nature. It's who you are. It's Jesus manifesting himself through you. And it's absolutely amazing. It's beautiful. So when we look at the different verses on grace, it begins to paint a picture. We begin to see that grace is a gift that's freely given to us, that we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 24. Romans four sixteen. That is why it depends on trust in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, the trust of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Right? And you skip down to chapter 5, verse 2. It says, through him we have also obtained access by trust into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in expectation of the glory of God. And if you go through and you see it over and over and over, it begins to paint a picture. It begins to show you what grace actually is. Because if we keep the, the preference definition in grace, then saying, well, God gives us preference because of this. He gives us preference because of that. And it's like, no, 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 that's not the way it works. God does not show favoritism. And that's Galatians 6.24 that I read to you earlier. So when, when you begin to look at how God actually operates, he's completely just. He's completely fair. This is his nature. This is who he is. He give, he's an equal opportunity God. He gives the same opportunity to everyone to believe, to be saved, to be set free, to be healed. All these different things come into play. And here's the thing. Here's the catalyst. The catalyst is Jesus Christ. You place your trust in Jesus Christ that he lived, he died, resurrected on the third day, and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. We enter into his grace. We enter into the, the unmerited work that reconciles us back to God. And it's absolutely amazing. Because if we go real quickly to, to Luke chapter 17, and it's towards the end of the chapter. Give me a second. Um, Make sure I'm in the right area. Okay. Well, give me a second. (laughs) while I was in the wrong area. So while I'm looking at something, let me just give you a little history on on this parable. So the, the, the disciples are actually asking Jesus for faith. And he, he talks to him about the the servant, right? Let me just tell you the parable. The servant, when he comes from working in the field, does he tell does the master tell the servant, "Go ahead and make the meal for yourself, and then come and sit down and eat," or does is it right that you know that the servant goes and makes something for his master and and serves him, and after the master eats, then he goes back and he eats. 
And so when we look at it, we begin to realize, you know, what Jesus told them was he's basically telling them, if I have to tell you everything to do, you're an unprofitable servant. And so when we're looking at this, it's uh, 17 7. Sorry. Let me. So, all right. So, let me go ahead and read it to you since I paraphrased it already. So, starting in verse 5 of Luke 17, it says, The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith, increase our trust. And the Lord said, If you had trust, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at, at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you, have, that you were commanded, say we are unworthy servants, for we, only, we have only done what was our duty. So you look at the, the context, it's, it's concerning increasing trust, right? And when we're looking at this, you begin to begin to paint the picture that that Jesus he's saying do that all that I've commanded you. He's already shared with us what to do. He's already told us what to do. But we keep asking him for something different. We keep asking him for a special word, a special calling, a special direction. When in actuality, Scripture is very clear that we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That includes out your front door. That includes inside your house. Right? And so you, how does this connect to grace? How does this connect to unmerited favor? Because here, if you begin to look at it from the reprocity system, then it makes sense. Because here he's expecting them to do something for him, right, without him having to tell them step-by-step directions. But what do we want to do? We want to get step-by-step directions because we're scared to make a mistake. And this ties back into what we talked about last week, you know, operating out of the flesh and operating out of the spirit. So the thing is, is, God, it's like this. You can steer a moving car easier than a car that is not moving at all, right? So a lot of times we've been so caught up in making mistake and 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 messing up and stepping out of the grace of God that we are actually entering into paralysis by analysis. We're too busy trying to analyze and think, and when we overthink to ourselves what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, what it's supposed to look like, that it causes us to do nothing at all except make great excuses. But when we go back and we look at what it's saying for grace, remember the the parable of of the vineyard where the man lends it out. All right, let's go to Matthew 20. Starting in verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who, who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. So this one um, still ties in. It wasn't the one I was thinking of, but this one still ties in. And it says, He agreed to pay them a, a denarius for the day, and sent them into the vineyard. About nine o'clock in the morning, he went out and saw others staying in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went, and he went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, 
Why do you, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in, in my vineyard. When evening came, the landowner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and, and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired around five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. Interesting, right? So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But his answer but he answered one of them, and I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for denarius? Take your pay and go. And I, I want to give the one who is hired last the same as I give you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So... Here we can see that there's no preference. There's no preference to the the one that he hired first and the one that he hired last. He he treated them the exact same. He 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 valued them the exact same and paid them the exact same. He rewarded them the exact same. Right? And so I'm looking at a whole list of parables. <laughs> And so when you go back and you begin just looking through the parables, it begins to make sense. It begins to make sense with the ten virgins, uh, the, the parable of the talents, which is found in Luke 19, also Matthew 25, um, the sheep and the goats. Um, in, in so many of these parables, God, Jesus, is pointing out how, how the kingdom actually works. Why it works the way it works, and I had never seen it through the the mindset of of like um reciprocity. So understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying to be saved, you need to work for God. Okay, that that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that once you are saved, once you are a believer, once you have wholly committed your life to God and it no longer belongs to you. You, you. It's been paid for with a price and your life is no longer yours. It belongs to God. So if you look at pick up the cross and follow me, if you look at count the cost, if you look at before a builder builds, he makes sure that he's able to build it completely. If you look at all these different things, you begin to realize there are certain commonalities here in that we don't live our lives for ourselves. We now live our life for God. And this is something that is, is at the very root, it's at the very core of what we believe and understand, but yet because of the, the mixture, because of the twist, of the word grace in Western culture, we make it seem like, well, God favors you. He gives you preference so that he can prosper you more. And so this is complete error. It completely throws everything off and is completely steeped and rooted in greed. Because, you know what, real quick, I know this isn't the topic, but let's talk about tithe for a second. Okay? So the the very first example of tithe is with uh, Abraham in the Old Testament in Genesis and he gave the King Melchizedek the, the high priest before God 10% he says he gave him a tithe okay and we'll go into the details of that in a second and then you have Jacob Jacob declares that he will give a tithe okay so what we're going to be comparing is is good works compared to dead works. Yes, I said that. So we're going to look at the good works 
compared to, to dead works. Because there's two different mentalities between Abraham and Jacob. Because if we go and we look at when Jacob declares that basically, in essence, what he says is that, God, if you will bless me, I will give you 10%. What? Yes, that's what he says. He says, if you will bless me, I will give you 10%. But when we look at the mentality and the mindset of Abraham, Abraham is, I am blessed, therefore I give you 10%. You've blessed me already, and I can't help but give you 10%. When you word it that way, that's a lot better. Right? Two different mindsets. Now, Mind you, I'm not going into the part of the tithe where tithe was always food. It was never money. And they only actually gave tithe six or seven times a year. And it actually came out to more like 20 or 30% of their living. So, yeah, you figure that one out. You find that's why it says in Malachi 3, bring food into my storehouse that, that it might have, you know, food to eat. And so all of that ties in, shows that it's not money, but tithe is, um, you know, uh, food and, and everything because it, it was to support the Levites of the time so that they had food and, and shelter and uh, different things like that because they could always barter and trade and other things. But anyways, so beside the point, when you, when you begin to look at the different mindsets, you begin to realize these are the two mindsets that have been adopted in the church. Because people will tell you, give so that you can get from God. Instead of realizing that everything's already God's, absolutely everything belongs to God. It says the heavens and the, and the earth and the fullness thereof are His. The gold, the silver, the cattle on a thousand hills, they're all His. And you're going to give him 10% because he entrusts you with it? you got to see something wrong with this. And we're doing him a favor? We're doing a work for him? We're, we're giving him preference by giving him 10%? See how none of this connects. None, none of this makes sense at all. So when we look at grace and we begin to look at how this is, we're not trying to earn anything from God, but out of the gratitude, because Abraham is the father of us all, because he trusted God, he stepped out, he believed God. And that's why God set up covenants, and that's going into covenants and everything else in the Old Testament. But you begin to realize that through this, God was able to establish grace. He was able to to lean and, and direct and guide the, the, I would say, the lineage of grace, right? Because it comes through Jesus, and Jesus was fulfilling the Abraham covenant. And you begin to see how all this begins to come into play, and it makes perfect sense, and it flows, and it's very simple. You know, we, I can dive into the history. I can, I can pull out, you know, the, the Hebrew and, and everything in the, the culture and show you how everything ties together. And that's all good, and it's informational. But at the end of the day, it's important for you to understand that God has given you undeserved, unmerited favor, work. He's done a work that we didn't deserve, and that he reconciled us back to him. And how did he do it? He did it by love. Did we deserve his love? No. Didn't. So you see, everything, even when we look at Jesus in, in John chapter 1, I think it's in verse 16 or verse 18. It says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's full of cares and truth. So he did many things for many people who didn't deserve it. 
And then this makes sense because you begin to realize, hey, it's not about judging at all. Then Matthew 7 verse 1, judge and you will be judged, makes perfect sense. Because even in John chapter 8, you find that Jesus says, I judge no one. But the words that I've spoken have judged you already. Yes, it says that. So here's Jesus. He's saying himself that if, if anybody hasn't believed his, wo- his witness, his voice, and, and ob- obeyed them, that he does not even judge them. And you begin to see that we're, we're very quick to judge. We're, we're very quick to, to pass sentence. But because of grace, the grace that God has given us, and to exercise that same grace on others is his nature. That's why he says, what does it profit you if you only love those who love you back, who reciprocate your love? What does it profit you if you only do good to those who do good to you? Because you see that Jesus was absolutely full of grace. You look at God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We look at John three sixteen, and we finish that verse, and you begin to realize we didn't deserve his love. We didn't know love. He had to demonstrate love to us first. So that he first loved us. No conditions. Unconditional love, agape, right? Unconditional love. There's no conditions. And this is the love that God's calling us to. This is grace. This is what he's exemplifying. This is how it ties in. This is how everything comes together. Because then you begin to realize that from unmerited favor, from unconditional love, there's nothing attached. So when you begin to understand God's love and how we're supposed to love him unconditionally, whether you know it rains or whether it's sunshine, or whether you know it's dark and gloomy or whether it's perfect – and, and, you know, anything grows in the land, and, and you're just prospering everywhere you go. It doesn't matter. We absolutely love God with this same unconditional love that he loves us, that he loved us first with, right? And from that, we begin to understand value and the value that he places on us and how that value changes everything. It changes our, our perception, our identity, and how we, how we walk because we realize that he loves us completely, unashamedly, and he's transforming us through this love to where we, it's not in our best interest to continue in sin. Where it's, not to, it's not a validation. It's not a license to continue in sin because it's actually it's, – it's pretty close to the opposite of sin. Right, Because when you look at the, the work itself, it was to redeem us and save us from sin. But anyways, so when you begin to look at love from this perspective, then it's God who is bringing this validation, is bringing this totality of his love into your heart, and it begins to overflow. So now you're not looking to people to fulfill love in your own heart, in your own life. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do because you become so founded and so stable in his love in you and for you that you become completely unshakable. It doesn't matter if somebody yells at you that day, if somebody spits in your face and and yells and screams and curses you out. None of that matters because of unconditional love, because of grace. Jesus is our model, and he was full of grace and truth. How do you think we're supposed to operate? How do you think we're supposed to walk? It's not full of grace and truth. Now understand, that doesn't mean we just let bad things slide. No, you see that Jesus was constantly correcting the religious people of the day. He was constantly correcting wrong paradigms and mindsets. He was constantly correcting sin. So when you look at this, and you begin to... To realize the impact of what it means to have a merited favor from God as in a merited work or uh, an unmerited um, – the, the only word for it is grace, right? You have this grace from God that has nothing to do with preference. 
in everything to do with what he accomplished in and through Christ. And he's still accomplishing in you through Jesus Christ in his nature. And this is the beautiful thing. Because if you step into his grace, nobody can take it from you. You can't lose it. Because it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on him. The only thing you it's required of you is to trust and obey him and grow up into him and grow up in, in relation to his relationship with him. And this is what changes everything. It's it's very simple. We make it complicated. We we make it, oh, this versus this, because everything's at odds against each other. Instead of completely trusting and relying on God for who he is. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his loving kindness and his enduring mercy. Thank God that he doesn't kill us in our sleeps because we have one bad thought because that goes completely against his nature. He doesn't even think bad thoughts. And he's so holy, so pure. Thank God for grace. Then you realize it's not a license of sin. It's not a license of preference in in everyday life. It's more coming to the reality of fact, of truth, timeless truth. You're stepping into a timeless truth that wipes away the the ordinances and, and things that are written against us. And it completely gets rid of them. Completely destroys them. As if they never happened before. Because you realize the Spirit of God can't come and live in you until sin is dealt with. Jesus would have just brought the Holy Spirit and made it possible for, for him to live in everyone, which he did by his death on the cross. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go like he did in the prophets of old. The men of God are in old times before Jesus. It's, it explicitly says they, the Spirit of God would come and go. And they would prophesy and they would speak as moved by the Spirit of God. But for us, he comes and he lives and he abides in us. We become his habitation, his temple. And that's why we're a new creation. A creation, a prototype that has never existed before. See, a lot of people will tell you, oh, he restored us back to Adam. He didn't restore us back to Adam because we're a new creation. New. Not restored. Doesn't use the word restored creation. We are a new creation. When you look at Second Corinthians and you see that it says that that the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam, it doesn't say second Adam, it says the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. So we look at Jesus, who's full of grace and truth. He is our example. He is a pattern in which we should live our lives, extending grace and mercy and love. When we truly become Relying on God. When he truly becomes our source for everything. Nobody can make you mad. Nobody can make you jealous. Nobody can make you envy. None of that. And you begin to realize why Paul wrote in in chapter 1 of of Romans. That nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from his love. God's love. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. So you begin to see the importance of grace. And I challenge you, go back and read the parables. Go go look through all, every single parable. So you have to lay down your life. You have to bring it into submission to Jesus. You have to lose your life to save it. Over and over. Jesus is saying it over and over. And the sad thing is that many Christians want to live a resurrected life without ever dying. 
right? Because you want to do your will. You want to do it how you want to do it. You want to do it on your conditions and everything else. Instead of saying, God, I completely surrender to you. I'm completely bow before you. I, I submit myself completely to you because you are, you are trustworthy. You are loving. And I know that you completely deserve a completely surrendered life. He did something for us that we could never do on our own. He reconciled us back to God. It was impossible for us because we're slaves to the sinful nature. But he comes and he he places in us the very nature of God, which changes us and transforms us from the inside out. That's an amazing grace. That's an amazing work. And then we reap the byproducts of that grace, of that work, which is power, which is so many different things, generosity, healing, miracles, interpretation of tongues, apostles, prophets. Yeah, all of them. They're not the gift. They're the effect of the gift. If you go back to Ephesians 4, you look at what it says in, in the, the verses before 11 and 12. See, people would try to make that say it's the gift. It's, it doesn't say that. It's doma there. It's the effect of the giving of the gift, which changes that whole section. And I'm telling you, those are all effects of grace. Effects of grace. Look how powerful grace is. How amazing graces that God has showed to us. And I know I'm running close on time. So I just want to say I'm going to kind of go back and clarify this as much as possible um, next time we meet. So if you have any questions, please submit them, write them out, share. It, it's very interesting. It's really changed so many things um, in my own heart, in my own motives, because it becomes extremely simple, black and white, and I'm not trying to get something from God. I realize because of God, I already have that something. You already have that something. But if you don't realize it's there, you'll never use it. If I went while speaking in this message and I went to every single one of your houses and and you need a gas and I put a $20 bill under seat, under the seat of your car, you would go without gas because you didn't know it was there. And this is what people have been going through and, and that they've allowed themselves to be deceived by the devil. Because God has given us everything. He's given us his son us everything. That's why we're named co-heirs with Christ. We get to participate in the entire heir, right? The everything that's given would bestowed on an heir. Co-heirs I mean we all receive the exact same thing. And you know, we can dive more into that and and explain it out more. I hope I did it some justice. <laughs> as, well, as you can tell, God's really, you know, he's still bringing some stuff to light. He's still dealing with some, some areas of my own life. And, you know, one thing that it's really brought to the forefront is just realizing how God, Jesus, he, he deserves a life of complete, utter surrender. Not just because of what he accomplished, but because of his love for us. Mainly because of his love for us. Because that's what ultimately led to what he accomplished. So you have any questions, Dorothy? Anything stood out to you or, or or any comments? I thought that was excellent. And, you know, one of the things that I really like is as you go through your walk, you find out that the things you like and want to do are really what he wants to do. 
I, I don't know how to properly explain that. But it's like, it's not that you're giving up your will or giving up things that you want to do. It's just that what you want to do changes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, it says that God gives you the desires of your heart. Well, he's the one who created your heart. Right? So a lot of times, without us realizing it, our desires are actually his desires that he put us from the very beginning. He put into our hearts from the very beginning. And the problem is, is we we think we know better than God on how to accomplish it, accomplish them, or to get to that destination. Instead of realizing the only way to get to that destination is with God and through God. Because God blesses us, and he makes us rich, and he adds no sorrow. So when you do it your own way, you do it the world's way, it's full of sorrow. It's full of Many things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And I think Compared one of the yes. yes, one of the biggest things that irks me to no end is this prosperity stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I consider myself very prosperous because I'm in the Lord with His blessings and mm-hmm. His grace. But I don't have hardly any money, you know. I don't have a bunch of yeah. new stuff, but I'm prosperous. Yeah. In the Lord, you know? And and people just equate prosperity with money and things and and it's just one of the yeah. saddest things in the in the body of Christ. Yeah, it is. And you know, to to a certain extent there you have to understand that there's there's actually a balance, there's a middle of the road that we need to find. And I was just, you know, talking with a brother in the Lord um, today about about the body of Christ as he was quoting um, another gentleman who has a uh, discipleship ministry. And he said that out of all of Christianity, it's so many hundreds of millions of dollars um, that come in. Every year, and that's that's for the industry. That's I'm talking about music. I'm talking about different things like that. It's hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, maybe even billions, and only one percent of it goes to reaching the lost. One percent, right? One percent, yeah, goes to reaching the lost, and the rest of it goes to. You know, building up, making it more comfortable for the Christians to stay where they're at. And, you know, oh Lord forbid if they feel uncomfortable or they're they're forced to go out and minister and share the gospel like we're commanded to by God. So you can see how the enemy's really reversed how we do everything. Well, when you look at Jesus and you look at, yes, people supported him financially because we know that, that money answers all things according to Ecclesiastes, but it's the root of all evil. So it's not to ever to be a god. It's not ever to be anything other than a tool. And Jesus used money as as an, a tool effectively. He was constantly giving to the poor everywhere he went. Right? He was taking care of them. Right. He was, he was taking care. He took care of his entire team of disciples. He he even paid Peter's taxes. Right. Yes, <laughs> so he, he did. He did <laughs> it was it was it wasn't just meeting the need. It was it was more than that because he was able to bless others as well. And that's where God wants us. He he wants you you know financially blessed, obviously, because you can do more for the kingdom. You can give more. The problem is, is in mainstream church, as you're saying, they're more focused on being blessed instead of being the blessing. That's a good way of putting it, yes. And so when we actually look at it, because imagine, imagine if the majority of your income was for reaching the lost. Where would we be if all of Christianity, just in the United States, Stood on that. Now understand that the United States provides between um, last statistic I saw between sixty and eighty percent of all missionaries. United United States supports 
sixty to eighty percent of all missionaries around the world. And the closest second place is like ten percent. So you see the importance of how much one percent within the United States <laughs> does effectively around the world. Now imagine if you're if people are giving eighty, ninety percent for the kingdom of God. Creating businesses and 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 different things like that to support the kingdom of God in the advancement of the kingdom of God, imagine what it would look like. I can tell you very quickly, we preach the gospel around the world three or four times in a year, if that was the case. Because everybody would be going and doing. Right? Because finances would never be an excuse. So, yes, and you're absolutely right. Prosperity is more than finances. It's 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 emotional health. It's psychological health. It's it's great relationships and friendships and and so much more. Do you have anything else to add? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's all I've got. You gonna close us out with some prayer? Yes, I'm going to pray and, um, you know, just challenge everybody. Go back and and look at the parables and and look at how, you know, the – I'm going to have to go back and look for the the parable. I thought I had found it um, where Jesus says this this master of the vineyard, he lends it out to some servants and then he leaves. And then he sends a servant to go check on it, and they kill him. And he sends another servant, and they kill him. He sends his own son. He says, surely, this is my son. They won't kill him. And then they kill him. And the Pharisees realized he was talking about them, right? And they, they got upset at Jesus. But, it, you know, they even answered. They said, well, the master would send people to kill those wicked servants and replace them with new servants so that when he comes, he can receive the harvest. There's all these things that we overlook that there's an expectancy from God, right? Because a lot of times we use the the phrase, well, God sowed a son to reap sons, right? Which I don't like. I I like God sowed a perfect son to reap perfect sons. And so when you begin to look at it from the aspect of grace and, and what that means, and, and why he's expecting something in return, just like the parable of the talents, he's expecting for a return on investment. It's like, well, no, now, now God's overstepped his bounds because now he's expecting something from us. It's like, no, that it basically what we're talking about is an exchange of grace, which is very interesting. And it's, it depends on your perspective and how you view it is how it comes out, how it manifests itself, and how you view God. So go back, look at the parables. It'll it'll start clicking. I'm telling you, um, understanding will start coming. And there's probably a better way to explain this. And I'm I'm still you know digging it out. And you know we'll 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 talk about it more next time. So let me pray for you. Let me bless you, and we'll go ahead and close. So, Father, right now, I I thank you for everybody who hears my voice. Father, I just thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for your mercy. Father, I pray that as we study this out, that we get such a revelation, we get such an understanding that it doesn't just change how we walk practically, but it gives us a deeper insight and revelation of who you are. In our, and also in our relationship with you. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your nature. I thank you for your character and all that you've done in Christ Jesus and through Christ Jesus in our lives in the lives of others. So, Father, I thank you right now. Anybody who hears my voice, if there's any sickness, sickness, you go. You bow your knee and you leave 100%. There's any lack. Lack, you go now. 
finances and prosperity. And you fill every area of their life because they are blessed. Not because they did anything, but because they are blessed by God. And out of the blessing, everything flows. Everything comes. And Father, I thank you right now, in Jesus' name, for making us completely whole, missing nothing, lacking nothing. You made us whole through Jesus Christ. And I thank you right now that people's bodies are being made whole, that people's souls are being made whole. Spirit is completely reconciled to you, joined to you, becoming one with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you. I would like to say, <laughs> Father, bless okay. everyone, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, and Father does expect you to use critical thinking at all times. So that's what he, remember your parents used to say, God gave you a brain, you're supposed to use it. That's really true. He expects you to use it um, and fully understand everything he has given and done for us and be a blessing to someone else. You know, even if it's just a smile, be a blessing. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Anthony. You have Thank a you. blessed couple honor. of weeks. You too. And we will be um, chatting you chatting to you next time from Germany. So it'll be amazing. That'll be cool. As long as you don't speak in German. No, it'll be in English. <laughs> okay. Just checking. <laughs> Good night, Anthony. Good night, Dorothy. God bless you. Bye. <laughs>